Uh, turn tonight, please, to Judges chapter number 12. Judges chapter number 12. Let's pray, and then we'll go on. Heavenly Father, thank you for your words to us and <clears throat> for your message, and I pray that we would know it and understand it and accept it and believe it. I pray that you would help me to teach your word faithfully and accurately and that <clears throat> always that we would receive it as the word of truth. And Father, pray that you would help us in a, <clears throat> in a book like this to discern uh, the truths that are being exposed. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> I want to begin with a bit of an apology. We're not with a bit of an apology. <clears throat> Um, if you have a bad day at the office, <clears throat> you have a bad day out of sight most of the time with the people you go to church with, but when I have a bad day at the office, I have it in front of you. And I roundly condemned Jephthah the last week, I believe, although I didn't go back and listen to it, that I declared him to be a complete and total pagan. And uh, <clears throat> the reality is, is that he is mentioned in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 11.32, as one whose faith was commended. So he cannot have been a complete and total pagan. <clears throat> um, he is a little bit of a conundrum to us, and I think that we all would recognize that. Um, <clears throat> but it really just was a, a flaw in the preparation process that I didn't trace the trajectory of his life through the, through the remainder of the Bible. And in fact, uh, <clears throat> Samuel himself mentions him as one of the deliverers that God had raised up when he is rebuking the Israelites for demanding a king. <clears throat> and he, <clears throat> Samuel really is the end of the judges, and he includes himself in that list. Uh, first, no, I don't remember the reference, but it's, it's in First Samuel. So, <clears throat> so anyway, obviously what the Bible teaches overrides anything that I would teach. And, and seriously, our task is to line up with the scriptures, not uh, con you know, <clears throat> convert the scriptures into uh, to our position. Um, nevertheless, Jephthah's vow is not a virtue. Um, and uh, <clears throat> uh, I, I have thought because the, the context of Hebrews 11.32 is that time would fail me to tell you about Gideon and Barak and Jephthah and Samson and I'm going, I wish you would take the time, Lord, to tell me about Gideon and Barak and Jephthah and Samson because I'm obviously much confused. <clears throat> um, but uh, <clears throat> this evening, we come back to Judges chapter, we come to Judges chapter 12 and the seven verses that comprise the end of Jephthah's earthly life and ministry. Um, and again, we're, we're going to find him, at least I find him, a conundrum. He cannot be discounted as an absolute and utter unbeliever. Um, but it is equally difficult to look through his life and cultivate points of virtue that you would recommend to others. God raised him up as a deliverer, and we want to take nothing away from that, but he was a deliverer for his time. And part of the problem with Jephthah is the time in which he lived. <clears throat> um, chapter 11 tells us about the man. It tells us about the sad situation of his early life, uh, his rejection uh, on the basis of a birth over which he had no control. Um, it tells us that he went on to develop into a rather cunning warrior uh, we will see yet again tonight that by personality, he is a very strong kind of man. He was a, a mighty man of valor. He was a, he was a mighty warrior. He was, a, he was most certainly a man comfortable um, in the world of physical conflict, and uh, he did not shy away from people. 
Um, and when we get to the end of chapter 11, we find that unfortunate incident of the offering of his daughter. And, and again, and I'm not necessarily saying that you should, but you know, you could go to the internet and read all kinds of literature on there and all kinds of detail about possibilities of Hebrew wording and whether or not he actually did offer her. But it seems to me that the text of scripture is clear that he did offer his daughter um, as a sacrifice to the Lord, to whatever extent that availed. And in our passage this evening, uh, the tragedy of Jephthah's life does not end. And uh, this time the tragedy comes once again from within. And let's just go ahead and read the verses. It's a relatively short passage and we'll make reference to it. But Judges chapter 12, verse number one, the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and went northward and said unto Jephthah, wherefore passest thou over to fight against the children of Ammon and didst not call us to go with thee? We will burn thine house upon thee with fire. And Jephthah said unto them, I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon. And when I called you, you delivered me not out of their hands. And when I saw that ye delivered me not, I put my life in my hands and passed over against the children of Ammon. And the Lord delivered them into my hand. Wherefore then are ye come up unto me this day to fight against me? And Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead smote Ephraim because they said, Ye Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the Manassites. And the Gileadites took the passages of Jordan before the Ephraimites. And it was so that when those Ephraimites which were escaped said, Let me go over, that the men of Gilead sent unto them, Art thou an Ephraimite? If he said, Nay, then said they unto him, Say now Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth, for he could not frame to pronounce it right. Then they took him and slew him at the passages of Jordan. And there fell at that time of the Ephraimites forty and two thousand. And Jephthah judged Israel six years then died Jephthah the Gileadite and was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. So once again, there's a tragic ending. Once again, there is an internal conflict. Once again, we find that the pride of Ephraim is the point of that spear. Ephraim was the youngest son of Joseph. And Joseph, of course, was the 11th son of Jacob. And he would then by divine decree, be one of the 12 that would form, the, excuse me, the 12 tribes of Israel. And God had decreed that the promised land would be allotted to the 12 sons of Jacob. Um, <clears throat> into that, he interjected this disclaimer that one of those tribes would not inherit land because they would belong to him and they would be his people and they would have the responsibility of the temple. And so the tribe of Levi was excluded from the land claim, and they were denied ownership of the land. And in order to make up then the 12, God took the two sons of Joseph and allotted them each a portion of Joseph's land. And so rather than Joseph being numbered among the 12 tribes of Israel, his two sons Manasseh and Ephraim are numbered among the 12 tribes of Israel. It is even a little more complicated than that because at the end of his life, as Jacob was blessing, which is more than doing, saying nice things about his family members, he flipped the birth order of Manasseh and Ephraim. And Ephraim was the youngest. Manasseh should have been the most honored but Jacob blessed Ephraim above Manasseh. And you can read about that. I think it's Genesis 49. And Joseph, of course, recognizing the violation of the convention protests, and Jacob says, no, no, I know exactly what I'm doing. Ephraim will outshine Manasseh. And, and so perhaps this is part of their heritage, this sense of having an exalted place and an exalted status that is conveyed generation to generation. Ephraim would go on then to become one of the names by which the northern tribes, the northern ten and a half tribes were known. 
the nation of Samaria. And in fact, in the, throughout the entire book of Hosea, they are referred to as Ephraim more than they are referred to as people of Samaria. Um, and the Ephraimites, and let me just ask you, if you would, to go back a few pages to Judges chapter 8, because this is not the first time that we have seen this kind of ugliness spring out of Ephraim. And, and we dealt specifically with the issue of pride in, when we dealt with that passage. Uh, Judges chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, the men of Ephraim said unto him, this, the him here being Gideon, why hast thou served us, us, us thus that thou callest us not when thou wentest to fight with the Midianites? And they did chide with him sharply. And he said unto them, What have I done now in comparison of you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? God hath delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb, and Zeb, and what was I able to do in comparison to you? Then their anger was abated toward him when he had said that, or as Solomon once said, a soft answer turneth away wrath. So Ephraim, to go back to Judges chapter 12, our passage is really very simple. It is really very straightforward. In verse number one, the Ephraimites once again expressed their displeasure that they had not been properly recognized by being summoned to help in the time of conflict. Wherefore, passed thou over to fight against the children of Ammon, and didst not call us to go with thee. We will burn thine house upon thee with fire. Now, this is a man who had just made the horrific vow, the heart-wrenching vow about his daughter. This is the man who had offered her in sacrifice. This is the man who had not only executed his daughter, but his only child. And now the Ephraimites are threatening to burn him and his house with fire. That brings us to the second part of the passage, verses 2 through 6, in which we discover that Jephthah is not Gideon. Jephthah is not Gideon. As Dale Ralph Davis said, Gideon dealt with the Ephraimites by employing psychology. Jephthah dealt with the Ephraimites by employing the sword. Gideon apologized. I'm sorry that I did not recognize your due. You guys are obviously far superior to anything that I could do, and it's a great error on my fault that I didn't honor you properly, and their anger was appeased. Jephthah said, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Who in the world do you guys think you are? I did call you. You didn't help. I had to go to battle, and if the Lord hadn't stepped in to deliver me, no discredit to the Lord there, if the Lord hadn't delivered us, who knows what the outcome would have been. And so what Jephthah does is... <clears throat> Turn the tables because, again, this is the kind of man he is. This is his track record, folks. Whether he's a believer or not, his, his track record is one of physical aggression. And, and that was why he became the leader, was because he was known for a man who was willing to drag out the sword. Now, we don't know exactly when that happened. <clears throat> the events that he is referring to are described for us in Judges eleven twenty nine through 32 when he makes the vow, when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him, he makes the vow, he passes over, same language, he passes over, and he goes to war. But to add insult to injury, folks, in verse number four, the Ephraimites have insulted the Gideonites in some way. And let's just make sure that we note that. The, exactly how to interpret the insult, I really don't know. But there is an insult here in this. Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gideon, Gilead and fought with them and the men of Gilead smote Ephraim <clears throat> why did that happen because because <clears throat> they and this are the these are the Ephraimites said ye Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the Manassites you're you're fugitives you're refugees you've escaped from us and you've gone into hiding in Gilead that's all you guys are. And of course, Jephthah takes great offense at that and gathers his army and goes to war against Ephraim. And there is, I would suggest to you folks, a distinctively vicious and personal dimension 
to this fight. And that is described to us in verses 5 and 6. Now look, we're going to see this kind of butchery in the book of Judges. We're going to see brother against brother butchery. It's, it's one of the components of the book. We'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. And here we have it with particular venom. Verse number five, so, so the, Gilead, the Gileadites are fighting against the Ephraimites and they are winning. And the Gileadites took the passages of Jordan before the Ephraimites. Passages, we would call them fords. Places where it was safe and convenient. Recognized crossing places. <clears throat> it would be where the bridges would be built today. So the Gileadites got to the bridges, got to the passages first. And they set up military outposts, <clears throat> sentries. And whenever anybody suspicious crossed, anybody that they expected might be actually an Ephraimite, they put them to the acid test. Verse 5, the Gileadites took the sons of the, took the passages of Jordan before the Ephraimites, and it was so that when these Ephraimites which were escaped said, let me go over that the men of Gilead sent unto them, art thou an Ephraimite? If he said nay, and he wasn't going to say yes, because that was certainly a death sentence, then they said unto him, say Shibboleth. <clears throat> Say Shibboleth. But what he actually ended up saying was Sibboleth, for he could not frame to pronounce it right. Again, most of the commentators will make some reference to regional dialects, you know, the difference between a Yankee slang and a Southern slang, but it's, it's pretty clear here, folks, that, that, that both in the wording that is used and in the way the story is told, that, that these are men who, for whatever reason, this was a group of people who had passed on some kind of hereditary lisp, not necessarily physically, but in the, in the way they learned to speak. They didn't say the SH sh sound very clearly. So it didn't come out shibboleth, it came out sibboleth. And that was a dead giveaway that they were Ephraimites and they were immediately taken off and slaughtered. And you just kind of think about the mentality the brutality that would go to that length and we end up with 42,000 dead Ephraimites. This is a bloody massacre by any biblical standard, by any battle standard, even a modern battle, 42,000 casualties. And that's the very last story that describes the life of Jephthah. There is then in verse number 7, his obituary, the closing commentary on his life. Jephthah judged Israel six years, <clears throat> then died Jephthah the Gileadite and was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. Now again, folks, we do want to, rec we do want to recover two th important factors. He was the deliverer that God rose up, and he was a man of faith. <clears throat> But I ask myself, when I get to the end of this story, do I have any more warm fuzzies about Jephthah than I did at the beginning? Is this the kind of conduct that we would find acceptable, that we would pass along to our children? And, and I think that the answer must be hardly so. Hardly so. <clears throat> he is one of God's deliverers. But to back away a little bit from Jephthah and look at the story in a little bit larger perspective, he is representative of one of the, one of the many mercies of God who is once again delivered a people whom he is in the process of judging. He is on the one hand dealing with them very severely and on the other hand he is periodically restraining his anger and Jephthah must be placed into that context. But the reality, folks, is that the habitual default position of idolatry practiced by Israel 
is not without consequence. And we don't just learn this in the book of Judges, folks. This is, a, this is a biblical principle taught throughout the scriptures that there is a deceitful element to sin and a hardening element to sin. That we don't just persist perpetually in sin and remain unchanged by what we do. Nor does God's position or attitude towards those who per- persist in sin remain unchanged. And we see this not in the life of Jephthah, but through the life of Jephthah. Of the 12 judges that we find in the book, six of them have very little information. I'm not encouraging you to read it, but if you read verses 8 through 15 of chapter 12, you find once again this very speedy list of men who lived, died, judged, but about whom we know nothing. Six of the judges are dealt with in a fairly detailed manner. The first three of those judges, Othniel, Ehud, and I would put Deborah and Barak together, they certainly labor together. You have a lot of information or relatively a lot of information about what they did, but very little personal history, very little personal detail. You're, you're, you're told who they were and where they were from, but very little else about them. And there's very little biography to commend them, but there's nothing by way of condemnation about these people. But Gideon, of course, becomes pivotal and in The next three that are dealt with extensively are Gideon, Jephthah, and Samson. And of the 12 judges, these three are dealt with not only in the most detail, but in the most biographical detail. You know more about their personal lives than you do any of the other judges. But each of those three judges comes at the end of their story to a tragic end. And when I say that, I'm putting the bloodshed of Abimelech, the son of Gideon, as his tragic legacy. So Gideon's life ends with Abimelech and his butchery. Jephthah's life ends with this incident. And Samson's life ends with him pulling the pillars of the temple down upon himself and the death of his I don't want to say unnecessary, but from a human standpoint, the unnecessary death that he experienced. So what God, what we have, folks, in the book of Judges, and and, and, and the spiral is there, is what we is the unraveling of a nation of God's covenant people. This is something difficult to watch. unfold historically in the Bible, and I I want to tread very lightly here for a couple of reasons. Number one, we are not, we as Americans are not a covenant nation like that, and number two, I'm, I'm not qualified to be a prophet, but in many ways, the world that you and I inhabit this day, October 2020, is a nation like we're reading about in the book of Judges. We are unraveling from within. We are unraveling from without. There is no way to separate that unraveling from the distinctive work of God with periodic episodes of mercy that, let's be realistic, who's kidding who, don't seem to have had a tremendous amount of spiritual impact. So again, Jephthah has to be placed into that that world and into that context. He doesn't exist outside of it. He's not above it. He is a part of it, just as we are a part of the fabric of our country, the fabric of the United States of America. With reference to Israel, here's the unique position in which Israel finds itself, folks. Because they are a covenant people, God has guaranteed that he will preserve their existence. This is not something he has promised 
of other nations, and we find that other nations have completely evaporated from the face of the earth. You probably aren't going to find anybody that identifies as a Moabite or an Edomite these days. Borders change, countries change, wars change things, nations come and go, but Israel is as old as the covenant that they have with God. But while God has promised that he will preserve them, he has not promised that he will bless them at all times and in all places because of that preservation. So we periodically find in the life of Israel episodes like this, where God is not going to take them out of existence, although he argues they deserve that, but he is going to make their lives incredibly difficult and unbearable. And therefore, folks, the nation of Israel got the, na- got the leaders it deserved. Right? Is Jephthah a believer? The writer of Hebrews seems to think so, and he has the spirit telling him so. Does, can I sweep away all the conflict and the tumult and the paganism from the mentality of Jephthah because of that? No. The Israelites got the leader that they deserved, and the confusion that surrounds the stories and the confusion that we are experiencing as a nation, if I could make that application, is one of the evidences that God is at work in judgment. And and I would point out to you folks that David himself prayed that God would confuse his own enemies. That, That David recognized that kind of confusion as a legitimate disruptive form of judgment. God confound them confound them, twist them and turn them and make them spin. So we we come to a passage like this and we just shake our heads. We're, We're fighting against the Ammonites who are a very real enemy, a historic enemy with a God ordained sanction to fight. And we're fighting against our own brothers who are our brothers with whom we are not supposed to be fighting. And so I I think that Jephthah occupies kind of this this twin dimension to us. We we talked a little bit about this last week. There are distinctly messianic strains to the life of Jephthah. There are similarities that are not coincidences. The, The way that his birth was used against him. And it was used against Jesus. We don't hold it against Jesus. We believe he was born of a virgin, but the Jews just thought he was illegitimate. Jephthah was despised and rejected, and yet he became the Savior. Jesus was despised and despised and rejected, yet he became the Savior. There are distinct messianic overtones. But on the other hand, folks, Jephthah is, as every human leader is, a clear billboard to us that the real Jesus had not yet arrived on the scene. The real Savior, the the incorruptible, upright, beyond reproach Savior was not Jephthah. And so they, they had a deliverer, but they did not have the deliverer. And so in Jephthah, we see what God can do in delivering a people, but we also see that we need God himself in his person, or as Paul would say, in the face of Jesus Christ to be our deliverer. So he's a man who served God in his own generation. That's the way Paul described David. He served the Lord in his own generation. And, And Jephthah lived and served in his time, and he has... God's approval, and he is a testimony to us as being a man of faith. But nowhere do we find the Bible commending some of the individual things that he did. So we'll, we'll leave it there. All right, if you want to take your...